Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We have some breaking news. We are, of course, following developments in the uh, Israel-Hamas war, but from breaking news in the U.S. Capitol, Steve Scalise, the man elected by the Republican caucus to be the next speaker, but who was short of the votes to do so, has just announced apparently inside the Republican conference that he is withdrawing his name from the speakership. We don't know why, other than the whip count vote against him within the Republican caucus today had ballooned to 16 or 17 votes. There were people saying that he could not get to the 217 needed to be elected Speaker of the House. Of course, this comes a week after Kevin McCarthy was deposed by a far-right MAGA caucus, which initiated a motion to vacate the chair that was successful with eight members voting aye, along with all the Democrats. There's been a Speaker pro temp, Patrick McHenry, since then, serving in a kind of custodial fashion. This is all totally unprecedented in American history. We haven't had this before. It's 100 years since we had a motion to vacate the chair. Amidst a unfolding global crisis, the second in line to the president and constitutional office of Speaker of the House remains vacant with no clear path for this House Republican caucus to rally behind anyone for an election. I believe we have Ali Vitali joining us now to fill us in. Ali, I literally just learned about this before we went to air. What is going on? Chris, I literally just learned about it before you went to air. This is all happening in pretty much real time here. We were confused when Republicans said that they were going to notice a 730 meeting. There was no real reason why they would do that. It wasn't clear that Scalise had moved any of the members that said they would never vote for him. It turns out that at, on his way into the meeting, he said he was going to have more conversations. We're going to hear what those conversations were. But it turns out that in the room, he said he was dropping his bid for speaker aware of the fact that he was going to be shy of the 217 votes that he needed. What's important here is, on the, on the one hand, it's back to the drawing board for the rest of the Republican conference now because they have to go back, likely behind closed doors, do another kind of secret speaker election, see if they can't get consensus at that point, and then try to bring it back to a more public floor vote. We never even hit that phase with Scalise. But there are still going to be people who are jockeying for this, including the man who was Scalise's official challenger in this round of the speaker's race, Congressman Jim Jordan. He's someone who had thrown his support behind Scalise, but he never lost support from some diehards within this conference. I do have to say, though, I don't think it matters who the person is. They are all going to have an immensely difficult road getting to the magic number that they need to actually become speaker. In my conversations with members earlier today, when they did about three hours of basically an airing of grievances behind closed doors, some of them apparently in that meeting even joked that they don't even think Jesus could get 217 votes in this conference. And as much as that's hyperbole and it's a punchline, I'm actually not sure that they're wrong because it is an immensely difficult conference to herd these cats within. Every single vote counts. Every individual's concern or question counts. And that's what makes this so difficult. And it's why Kevin McCarthy had such a hard time back in January. Yeah. And we should note again that that it, when you when you have four votes to spare in the caucus, right, yeah. uh, and you're expecting a party line vote because you're elected by the entire House, you may get six or seven people who are no's, right, who have mutually exclusive asks. I mean, this yeah. was the thing that was unfolding that, with me is that it's one thing if there's a block that says we're a hard no and we want these three things. If you've got six yeah. or seven or eight or 17 in the case of the last whip count that NBC, I think you, Ali, and your reporting have yeah. produced about the Scalise no votes, and they're all over the map, it's not even like there's a negotiation you can do. Exactly. It's not like you're going conference by conference, caucus by caucus, and saying, okay, the moderates want X, the Freedom Caucus folks want Y. How do we put those things together? No. Scalise and whoever comes after have gone literally individual member by individual member. Not only is that immensely inefficient, but it also means that some of these asks are going to come in direct clash with each other, and you can't appease everyone. So then you have to figure out, are you appeasing enough people to lose the people that you can't get on board? It's a true balance. Act, and it's one that, frankly, again, most of the members that I've been in touch with for the last 
two weeks or so, up through the motion to vacate, and even now, as they try to pick who comes next, there is not a clear consensus within this conference. Even when Matt Gates was threatening, I'm going to do a motion to vacate, the open question we had was, okay, if not McCarthy, then who? There was no clean answer then, and there's no clean answer now. And I know that for some Americans, this might seem inside baseball or not important to their life, but when you look at the larger geopolitical landscape right now, this is at the core of the way the House functions. Yes, it's in the line of succession for the presidency, you mentioned that, but it's also the way that they can do as little as condemn Hamas for what happened in Israel, and at most of sending military and humanitarian aid to Israel. Those are key priorities here, but they are effectively unable to do any governing whatsoever because they cannot decide who the Speaker of the House is going to be. It's an uh, important point there. I will note that, of course, speakership elections happen in the entire uh, House. Uh, yeah. In other state houses, sometimes there's been deals cut to get to someone consensus drawing across party lines. That I don't think anyone wants to do that now, but I, I, one imagines there might be some conversations uh, along those lines the longer this goes. There does have to be a speaker soon because the business yeah. of governing has to happen. <laughs> Ali Batali, who is on this story, <laughs> rushed to a camera at the last minute. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for doing that. Yes. Senator Cory Booker is a Democrat of New Jersey who serves on the Foreign Relations Committee. Last Saturday, he was in Israel when the Hamas attacks began. This is his first interview since returning to the United States. He joins me now. It's great to have you good, here. Good to be here with you in person again. Well, you, let me just start because you just learned, as I did, that Steve Scalise is withdrawn, which, you know, it's not your house, <laughs> uh, but it's all of ours in the sense it's the United States House of Representatives. To the point that Michael McCall, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, made, it also means that certain things can't be done over there. What is your reaction to that? Um, this is a problem. We are in crisis right now in the country. and We have important issues we should be dealing with. Resolutely uh, supporting the effort in Ukraine. Resolutely standing with Israel, uh, helping to aid in their defense and the protection of citizens and the evacuation of Americans from Gaza to Israel. There, there are many important issues, not to mention funding the government. So to have this level of dysfunction amongst the House Republicans and especially a number of small group of right wing folks who are undermining the functioning of government, this is very problematic at a terrible time going on in our world right now. You were in Israel uh, on that Saturday on uh, Simchat Torah when the, the Hamas massacre happened in the south. Um, you were also in the region, I believe, after that, if not mistaken. Um, what, are you, what is your takeaway back here, having been in the region at this moment of, of, of such awful crisis? Look, I was going there on a mission uh, because there is this pathway to peace that had opened up through the Abraham Accords. I went there to meet with Palestinian leaders, Israeli leaders, and then to continue in the region with people who really believe, as MBS said in an interview on Fox, that there is a credible pathway towards a grand bargain of regional peace with the Palestinian principle, a, a pillar being very key about it. Palestinian leaders for the first time were having conversations. In fact, Saudis for the first time came since 67 came uh, to the West Bank to meet with Palestinian leaders on a pathway to peace. And so here you have this terrorist organization whose very charter doesn't say for the destruction of Israel. The very charter is Hitler-esque. They want to destroy Jews launching missile, missiles. And so for me, before this, I got there early because it's a very important holiday for me personally. It's been about 30 years uh, since, as a Christian, I've been studying Torah and uh, really uh, uh, engaging in, in, in a faith that means so much to me. I danced with the Torah the night before these attacks, sat and had Shabbat dinner with friends, two of them who've lost family members. One family members were, were slaughtered in the kibbutz. The other was had a nephew who was called up to defend folks and was killed in defending lives, innocent lives. This is a ISIS-like terrorist organization who targeted civilians in the most heinous, staggering of ways. And what's more tragic for the Palestinians, who Hamas has murdered, kidnapped Palestinians, Hamas has brutalized its own people. And what is interesting about their pattern right now, known throughout everybody I talked about, talked with uh, in the Middle East, from journalists to business people to members of government, they all know Hamas's mission is to stop peace. And at the very moment that a pathway to peace opened up, that you heard from the Saudis, 
uh, from the Emiratis, uh, from uh, folks in Bahrain who understood that we had an opportunity here for a re-upping of the two-state solution. Hamas, terrorists, ISIS-like, Hitler-like folks who hate Jews and want to kill them opened up one of the worst terrorist attacks over the last 50 years. In terms of that, that peace process, we, you know, there was lots of uh, word being sent that, that there was a move towards Saudi and Israeli nationaliza uh, normalization, which, of course, would be an enormous change. I mean, one of the criticisms I've heard, and this is independent of what Hamas's motives are, which I can't really divine, and, you know, you can read their statements if you want to, um, is that it, it was an attempt to bypass, essentially, the peace with Palestinians, right? This idea that you would lock in normalization without resolving the enormous problem of two million people living in essentially a penal colony and the occupation of the West Bank. What do you, what do you say to that? Well, it's, that's completely wrong. I know that because I'm one of the founding members of the Abraham Accords. I've been very involved in a lot of this diplomatic work. I, I should be on a plane in about a week with Republicans, a small group of us, Republicans and Democrats, going to Saudi Arabia to continue these talks because we cannot let these terrorists, this ISIS-like, Nazi-like people win. We're going to continue these conversations. Is this going to derail that? We, I stayed in the region. I just came back today uh, because I didn't want to let it derail it. And from uh, Americans to uh, uh, Arabs in the region, everybody wants to continue this pathway. And centered in it, as the leader of Saudi Arabia said on Fox News, centered in this has to be uh, a pathway back to the two-state solution an irrevocable pathway back to the two-state solution. And in my conversations with Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans before this attack, we all agreed, State Department agreed, this had to be about peace. And so when the, the very moment when you hear Arab leaders openly discussing an opportunity for peace, an organization founded to kill Jews, who after the Oslo Accords 2014, when Arafat and Rabin get the Nobel Peace Prize and there's a pathway to peace, what does Hamas do right after that? They go after Israelis, they bomb buses, they target civilians, and then use their own people as human shields as Israel exercises its right to self-defense, hoping that the sympathy that they could maybe bring about by the people that they are endangering could somehow undermine support for a peace process. Well, we're seeing this again. And, and that's why the, the debate in America should not be a date. We should have a crystal clarity to support Israel and to call out these Nazi ISIS-like folks who are targeting civilians with an attempt not just to kill and murder Jews, not just to kill and use Palestinians as human shields, not just to target, remember, there's Nepalese, Argentinians, French, Americans that have all been killed or held hostage through this. We have to continue the pathway towards peace and human rights for Israelis, and Palestinians. We talk about um, sort of human shields and, and attempting to sort of curry favor or public opinion. Um, again, you know, I, I think the moral responsibility for what happens in Gaza, I, I can't even begin to debate about whose fault it will be. All I know is that there's 6,000 bombs that have been dropped, according to Israeli Defense Forces. That's more than monthly amounts on Raqqa or Mosul during periods in which we were bombing ISIS at highest levels of sorties that we ever did, right? What do you say to people who say this is there are millions of civilians there? What are what are we doing as a U.S.? Well, first of all, I, I'm in talks today uh, about creating a humanitarian corridor. There, there are Americans of Palestinian descent in yes. Gaza right now. Yeah. There are children and innocents suffering. And so we're going to continue as Americans to do everything we can to create a humanitarian corridor. These are, again, terrorists target civilians. Israel is a democracy, and democracies are stronger when they abide by the rule of law. President Biden has said that publicly, where you try to minimize casualties. And that is something that we all can call on Israel as they exercise their right to self-defense, um, to do everything possible to minimize civilian loss as these cowards and terrorists are using their own the, the, the Palestinian people as human shields. It is awful, and we need to do everything possible uh, to help to minimize that damage. But to me, th there should be no confusion about this for Americans. And, and I'll say this not just as a United States senator, not just as a patriot who would die for my own country, but I'm going to say this as a black man. When you're black in America, you understand the vulnerability within the own, your own country you love. 
I saw it as an adult on January 6th. The people that stormed the Capitol talked to Capitol Police or African Americans. They had signs of hatred, Confederate flags, the vicious, racist things they were saying to Capitol Police officers. But side by side, those symbols of hate towards black Americans were shirts like Camp Auschwitz shirts. Hate has an indiscriminate infection. This is why, as an American, as a black American, I will always stand against hate and stand with the people who are targets of hate. Just like the Nazis, who didn't just destroy six million Jews, they destroyed gay people, gypsies. I will stand with people who are targets of hate. Hamas, like the Nazis and like ISIS, are people who target with hate. I stand with Jews. I stand with Muslims. I stand with gay folks. I stand with people right now who all have a common cause to stand against Hamas because Hamas is an indiscriminately hateful people who do not want peace. They want to destroy others and stop us from having peace. This is not complicated, America. It is not complicated. We all must denounce hate and those people who use hate to destroy. That is Hamas. And so I am worried right now. I'm worried about rising anti-Semitism in the United States. I, I led with uh, three other senators, bipartisan, to call for more resources because hate is indiscriminate in its efforts. The same hate that killed blacks in a church in South Carolina are the same, well, the same people who are reeling the same hate that killed in a synagogue. And so we all need to take an understanding. Everyone has a responsibility to condemn the hatred of this ISIS Nazi like Hamas and do everything we can to try to get us back to peace, to affirming of human rights for all people in that region. And again, the protection of this country and this country's unfortunately too often targets of hate. Well, let me ask you this about, I mean, I think, again, if you could wave a magic wand to get rid of Hamas, I think people would take that. And, and we said this wand. off camera, I want folks to know, yeah. when I travel to these other countries, yeah. other Arabs, they all know what kind of organization Hamas is. I was almost lectured to by leaders in uh, other Arab countries just over the last few days about how horrific Hamas is, what the awful things they have done to Palestinians. Arab countries know how dangerous and vicious this organization is. So, I also spoke with someone who is still in Gaza City right now, Youssef Hamash. He works for a Norwegian NGO. He filed a report we played part of for UK's Channel 4. He's lived in Gaza his whole life and described what he's seen the last few days. Youssef Hamash is an advocacy officer with the Norwegian Refugee Council. He has lived in Gaza his whole life, and he joins us now. Uh, Youssef, thank you so much for talking to us. Can you tell us where in Gaza you are and, and, and what it is like there? Uh, thanks for hosting me. I'm located in Bethlehem, northern part of Gaza Strip. And if you want me to describe the situation, it's it's horror here. It's part of the hell here. Obama didn't stop for a second since six days in a row. Uh, wherever you go in Gaza, you will see you will see rubbles everywhere. You to cross from to to cross a distance from a place to another place. It's like a maze going from street to another street because most of the streets are blocked by rubbles and destruction everywhere. No food, no electricity, no water, no internet connection. Even I have to stand in the street just to get signal. I'm really surprised that that we still that this phone call is functioning because they usually drop down, to, uh, dropped off quickly. Situation is deteriorating really quickly. But for the most vulnerable people who had to flee from the northern part, eastern part of Gaza, seeking shelter in the normal schools, now they are full. Uh, even above their capacities. Now, people who are lucky to have some relatives who live in some areas that have been bombed, so they had to go seeking shelter at their houses. There is no one housing that is hosting one family. Everyone is hosting another, another one of their relatives who lost their house or they were forced to flee. Um, can, can you, you, you were there in 2014, the last time that there was uh, a war between Hamas and Israel in Gaza specifically, and uh, uh, 
is this more destruction? Are the are the airstrikes and is the bombing uh, a wider area than than that what happened in 2014 in these first six days? So it was two. 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, 2021, and between that also there was a lot of small ground yes. fights. This is because, but this is cannot be compared with what we witnessed previously. This is a massive bombardment that they are using. The bombardment all over Gaza Strip. There is no single place safe in Gaza. Usually, when you have escalation in Gaza, the most affected areas are the north and eastern part border areas. But now all of Gaza Strip is. <coughs> Is affected because, I mean, as you see, uh, you see uh, for sure everyone saw in the news that Central and Gaza situation, the remand area, have been turned to ash. Uh, situation is really difficult here. There is no place safe in all of Gaza. And for the people who don't know Gaza, it's now a piece of land. It's like a block of concrete that houses are connected to each other. So and now it's the situation now is not you cannot compare it with any war or escalation before. It's 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 madness. How um, you talked about the the, the the humanitarian basics, obviously shelter being one of them. We we have numbers that there are as many three hundred thousand people who are now homeless out of a uh, population of two million. Um, water, electricity is running out. Water, food, like where? How, how, just from a, uh, how are people acquiring food, and is there clean water still? Yeah, I mean, we have different sources of water in Gaza. One of them is the municipality lines, but the main issue is electricity, because even if you have the source of water, you cannot bomb it or push it into your houses. Right. And the number you are talking about, over 300,000 who are fled into Norway schools, they is double this, this number who fled to other relatives' house. And Shifa Hospital, uh, trashes. There is people are shattered everywhere in Gaza, just seeking shelter in different places. It's not only in rural school, it's mm -hmm. like every, almost every place that is not governmental and not any. Yeah, any place that is related to Norway, United Nations, uh, church. People are trying to secure themselves, convincing themselves that this, these places are safe. Yeah, for example, if you look to Shifa Hospital, it became from a hospital to a shelter. Right. But it's a tra it's transfer. It's a transfer. Yeah. How, I, I'm wondering what, what um, obviously the governing authority in Gaza, Hamas, uh, what are they saying to the, 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 the people of, of Gaza about what is happening and what is about to happen? There are people in Gaza are disconnected from the world and from everything else. Even internally, we cannot communicate with each other. There's no internet and there is no also signal to communication because right. all of these towers, signal towers have been bombed. And trust me, there's two million people that's in Gaza are thinking and are living day by day. At, no, sorry, they are living second, second by second because no one can ensure the next second that he will be alive. All what we think about is to secure our children, secure our basic needs. Every day I have to go to wait in line in front of a bakery for more than two hours just to get a bucket of bread. This is the situation in Gaza. Um, there is, of course, no way out because of the Rafa crossing. Um, do you, I mean, what, you just said it, I guess, second by second. Um, I, I, I hope that you and you can keep your family safe. Uh, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of your uh, taking time to talk to us. Thank you so much. And they are trying to scare myself. I had to flee from my house to my one of my relatives' house. I was lucky to someone is accepting to host me because I live in a bit border area. Also, my mother and my sisters are in a different one of other relatives' house. It's, the situation is really unacceptable. And also, we are getting every night. We are afraid from the night in general now. Whenever it's night, it's it's terror here. We are afraid. It's it's a horror movie every night. We are living. And we are always in and we are ready to see the daylight again.